All great human endeavors begin with a need, an idea, and the spirit to achieve greatness. The story of Red Hill has all three and more, for like most great feats, the need was more urgent, the idea more bold, and the spirit more powerful than originally anticipated. As the 1940s began, the world was in turmoil. In Europe, a resurgent Germany threatened peace. In Asia, Japanese troops occupied large expanses of China and threatened to take more. America, isolated and protected by two great oceans, was unprepared for the coming conflict. In Hawaii, at Pearl Harbor, a particular concern was the vulnerability and inadequacy of fuel storage tanks. Unprotected above-ground fuel tanks containing the entire fuel supply for the Pacific Fleet were scattered about Pearl, easy prey for enemy attack or saboteurs. To remedy the situation, it was decided in June of 1940 to build underground tanks. They were to be built in nearby hills at an elevation high enough for gravity flow of fuel to a fueling pier. The tanks were to be deep enough and situated far enough away from Pearl to avoid one attack destroying the fleet and its fuel. In addition to providing protection from attack, the rock surrounding the tanks had to be strong enough to act as the outer wall of each tank. Maps were read, specifications readied, ground studies prepared, and core borings taken. Finally, a long ridge of volcanic rock reaching from near Pearl to the Kulau Mountains was chosen. Red Hill. Originally, the plan was to tunnel out four large horizontal tanks. Red Hill was large enough to allow for these tanks, with plenty of room for expansion. One evening during dinner at the Halakulani Hotel, George Yeomans, the project manager, and James Groden, the consultant, were discussing the project. When Groden brought up an idea he had been mulling over, what if the tanks were vertical instead of horizontal? Quickly sketching his idea on a cocktail napkin, Groden proposed a series of tanks lined up like enormous underground wells. The big advantage to this scheme was obvious to both men. When tunneling horizontally, the excavated material must be loaded into trucks, hauled to an adit, the mine entrance, and transferred for disposal. With the tanks in a vertical position, a center shaft could be used as a waste chute down to a conveyor belt to whisk the material to the disposal area. Soon, cables were moving back and forth between Hawaii and Washington. There, Admiral Ben Morrell gave the go-ahead. The plan was simple, yet audacious, to build 20 tanks vertically underground. Tanks had been built underground before, but usually horizontally. These would be huge, 250 feet high and 100 feet in diameter. They would look like giant capsules standing on end, though they would never be seen. The tanks would line up in two rows of 10, two on each side of the center line of Red Hill. There would be upper and lower access tunnels with cross tunnels between each set of tanks the lower access tunnel would extend to the pump house at Pearl. To begin construction, two approach tunnels were dug to the beginning of the upper and lower access tunnels on the center line of the ridge. At the same time, work began on top of Red Hill. Crews using jackhammers and dynamite began to dig shafts down the center line of the tanks. The shafts would extend from the top of Red Hill to a point just below the bottom of the tank. The shafts were narrow, four feet by six feet down to the top of the tank, and then 14 by 14 from there to the bottom. This shaft was the key to Groden's idea and would be crucial to building the tanks. When the lower access tunnels reached the site of the first pair of tanks, cross tunnels were started to meet up with the shafts coming down from the ridge top. In the upper access tunnel, Cross tunnels were also begun, stopping short of the center shaft at a point called the spring line. The spring line is where the curve of the dome springs away from the vertical wall of the tank. Here, two crews working back to back began to dig, 
heading in opposite directions. They were starting a tunnel that would circle the proposed tank. This tunnel would be 15 feet wide and 321 feet long, encircling the spring line. Guided by surveyors, the crews met, each having dug half the tunnel. The crews then proceeded to dig up, clearing a six-foot space to what would be the top of the dome of the tank. When finished, the miners had carved out of rock a shape resembling an upside-down bowl. The next step was to cover this bowl with the steel plating that would serve as the lining of the dome. First, a framework of steel H-beams was pre-assembled above ground, then brought down and installed around the dome of rock. Next, 144 sections of quarter-inch steel were cut to size and brought down to be welded together to form the inner lining of the dome. It was precision work, for every weld had to be perfect, with not even a pinprick size hole in any joint. The work was hard, and the conditions were tough. Heat and dust rose, never to settle. The spaces were small, and the danger of a collapse was ever-present. This work was being done hundreds of feet underground, in tunnels blasted again and again, where the rock ceiling was weak and fragile. Death was a looming presence at Red Hill. On average, a man died every two months building this formidable project. Despite the danger, the work continued. As the sections of steel plate went in, the timber shoring was first removed, then reinstalled. When completed, the rock bowl was covered with an inner steel framework, a steel plate lining, and the timber shoring. Rebar was then tied in place, and the dome of the tank was ready to be encased in concrete. A surface hopper was placed at the top of the vertical shaft. Hoses extended down the shaft and into the area between the metal and rock to be filled. As the concrete was poured, workers had to quickly remove the shoring before the rising tide swept it under. The concrete pour was continuous and took 70 hours, nearly three days. The dome was now complete. It would provide miners working on the rest of the tank a safe roof above their heads. Work at Red Hill began the day after Christmas 1940 and was scheduled to go non-stop. Progress was interrupted only once. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese attack brought the work on Red Hill to a stop. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, the need for the underground tanks became clear to all and even more urgent. It was time to start on the tank vault. Miners descended down the shaft to just inside the dome and began to remove the rock between them and the dome lining. This was the real test for Groden's shaft. The 14-foot wide shaft would be widened to 30 feet. The excavated rock would tumble down the shaft to hoppers and feeders, which would direct the rock onto conveyor belts in the cross and lower access tunnels. The rock would then go through a rock crusher, able to reduce the largest pieces to small 10-inch pieces, and then out to the disposal area. At the spring line, a circular wooden platform six feet wide and 100 feet in diameter was hung from the dome. It could be raised and lowered by hand winches and was reached from an accordion stair that began at the end of the upper cross tunnel. All work on the tank would be done from this platform. Miners, attached with ropes, would descend from the platform, drill holes into the rock, insert dynamite in the holes, climb back up on the platform and blow the dynamite. Then they would do it again. As they dug, the miners gouged the pit into a funnel shape. The sloping sides allowed the blasted rock to slide down into the shaft to be carted away by the conveyor belts. It sounds so simple, but this was dangerous, dirty, hard, tiring work, and it went on without interruption. Miners had to be careful, for if they slipped, they too would tumble down into the shaft and a horrifying death. Despite the risks, Groden's shaft worked spectacularly, removing rock, reducing manpower, saving money and time. 
and time was most precious as war raged on above ground. Once the entire vault had been dug out, a steel construction tower was erected from the very bottom to the top of the dome. This tower supported all the necessary equipment for the installation of the concrete and steel tank lining. Piping connections from the lower access tunnel to the tank were installed. Reinforcing steel was put in place and the immense concrete plug that would act as the tank base was poured. Next, a bowl was shaped out of steel and concrete to sit atop the plug and provide support for the steel lining at the bottom of the tank. With the bottom of the tank complete, work on the cylindrical barrel that made up the bulk of the tank started. Row after row of steel plate backed with reinforced concrete was welded into place, up to just below the spring line, where an expansion joint was installed, finishing the tank. While work on the tanks continued, the upper and lower access tunnels, the cross tunnels, and the harbor tunnel and railroad, stretching over three and a half miles to Pearl, were also being built. Down at Pearl, a pump house capable of pumping 40,000 barrels of oil per hour and a pier over 1,330 feet long to serve both tankers bringing fuel for storage and ships that needed the precious fuel to fight the war were being built. Upon completion, the tanks had to be tested. After some preliminary tests, water was pumped in. The level was raised five feet at a time. If a leak was discovered, the water was lowered and crews in boats were sent in to repair the leak. During one test, a boat capsized. Two workers, unable to swim, couldn't get a hold on the smooth vertical wall of the tank and drowned. A completed tank was 250 feet top to bottom and 100 feet in diameter, big enough to hold a 20-story building. The tanks can hold six million barrels of oil, enough to power the average car for 500,000 years. The building of the Red Hill tanks used over 39 million pounds of steel, enough to build more than 12,000 automobiles. During construction, over 360,000 cubic yards of concrete were poured, enough to build more than five miles of interstate highway. The story of Red Hill is one of engineering innovation in response to a real and pressing need. The story of Red Hill is one of courageous spirit in the face of daunting obstacles and global conflict. The story of Red Hill is like that of all great human endeavors, a story of men and women who join together to reach a goal, and in the process, built an enduring monument to themselves and their nation. In 1995, Red Hill was designated a National Historic Civil Engineering Landmark by the American Society of Civil Engineers an important tribute to all who sacrificed so much to ensure its completion.